Well, let me invite Dr. Usha Sriram, who is our uh, next speaker. In fact, uh, Madam doesn't require much of introduction. Um, in fact, the Madam wears you know many hats, uh, starting from physician and diabetologist, medical ethics expert, women's health promoter, women's right activist, and she is the founder of Divas. Under Divas, uh, thousand plus women physicians have been trained uh, towards diabetes care and diabetes complication. In fact, she has been a strong voice for uh, women's health. In fact, today's topic, which really emphasizes uh, diabetes in women, women with CBD and the role of SGLT2 inhibitor. Oh, Tima. Okay, thank you so much. And I just realized how many hats I'm wearing. But um, you know, really happy to be here. And I thank BI for inviting me. And uh, what great company to be in to do this program. So um, what I am going to talk about uh, is first to set the stage on cardiovascular risk in women with diabetes, and then what the new um, evidence, the CV outcome trials, and what the professional societies with their guidelines, using that, how can we make decisions uh, for our patients? So we have known for the longest time from the earliest Framingham data that um, uh, diabetes is a bigger CV risk factor in women. Um, if you want to break it down and understand why is that happening, we can discuss that down the road a little bit. See, at a baseline, men have higher risk factor for heart disease. So definitely diabetes increases their risk also. But when it comes to women, their baseline risk is much lower and diabetes increases their risk many fold higher. And also, the moment a woman has diabetes, the 10-year advantage that she normally has in terms of heart disease protection is immediately erased. So you can also have premenopausal women, younger women, having heart disease, and that should be always in our radar. And this is an estimate of the relative risk and, uh, for fatal coronary artery disease in men and women, uh, published in the BMJ where you can see for age, when you adjust for age, women have much higher relative risk. And if you adjust for other multiple variables and confounders, again, women come out much higher than men in terms of risk for heart disease. And um, so depending upon, you know, depending upon method of diagnosis, and as Ramu had mentioned earlier, again, even from the region, um, women have higher risk of heart disease with diabetes. Now, um, CVD events in, in patients with diabetes, this is the 30-year follow-up study, and looking at the different types of heart disease, and that's relevant to today's discussion because we're going to talk about you know, heart failure and about um, you know, stroke and total CVD. And as you can see, heart failure is a very big problem for women very big problem, which is why I think when the newer agents that we have, which are slowly becoming actually heart failure medicines, that uh, cardiologists want to use this for heart failure even in people without diabetes, and those trials are going on already. Um, so how do guidelines and, and policies and best practices influence uh, our decision making? I'll just go through a few clinical scenarios and how we apply this, okay? So first one is a 54-year-old lady who has just been discharged from the hospital after an elective CABG. She was evaluated for unstable angina, found to have triple vessel disease, known diabetic for the past 15 years, been on metformin, glimiparide, voglibose, and citagliptin for the past three years. Her A1C fluctuates somewhere between 7.8 and 8.8, .8, and she was not on a statin till admission. So one of the important teachable you know, points here is, as is when you take people with diabetes, for some reason, we do not give them statin. We don't give all of them statins. Every person with diabetes over the age of 40, men and women, must be given a statin. Must. Their LDL must be kept below 100, and if they already have an event or already have established cardiovascular disease, it should be even lower, below 70. Or if they have multiple risk factors, it should be below 70. And there's also a trend now towards even lower LDL for people with established cardiovascular disease. So this, she was not given a statin. 
And a very uh, new, hot of the press study, says that this whole uh, discordant increased risk of heart disease in women, one of the reasons may be that we are not aggressively treating the women in terms of giving them a, a statin, in, in terms of giving them an, in, you know, an intense statin. We may be giving them some weak stuff. We may not be recognizing their symptoms. So that may actually be turned out to be one of the important reasons. So on uh, discharge, she was sent home on insulin, but asked to come back for adjustment of medications, obviously. And so the, what do the guidelines suggest for her? So this is the new 2018, 2019 ADA ESD guidelines, which is the best one that has come out in my lifetime, I think, because we are no more A1C centric. We are looking at people. We are looking at, do they have heart disease? Do they have heart failure? Are they having hypoglycemia? Are, they, are we concerned about weight? Are we concerned about A1C? Is low resource setting? I now work in a low resource situation, and this is particularly relevant for me. Uh, is it a low resource setting? So when you look at this, Im immediately they say, if the patient has established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or CKD, you will immediately go to an agent like GLP uh, receptor agonist, or you will go to a SGLT2 with proven cardiovascular benefit. So no question about it. So this is the, what we need to follow in this patient of ours. So just I just expanded this to show you, if ASCVD predominates, you have to give a GLP receptor with proven CVD benefit or an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven CVD benefit if EGFR is adequate. So as you know, the, the differences between the two is one is an injectable and one is an oral agent. And um, so that is something to keep in mind. And if A1C is above target, adding consider adding the other class with proven CVD benefit, DPP-4 inhibitor if not on GLP receptor agonist, and basal insulin. I mean, I'm not a fan of TZDs, and I don't particularly use it in women because all the complications of TZDs are seem to be aimed at women. Weight gain, edema, fractures, um, you know, um, you, you name it. OB, you know, weight gain I already mentioned, fractures I already mentioned, heart failure, everything seems to be stacked up you know, against women. So this is something that we want to keep in mind about picking, when you are picking TZDs in women. And we'll come to heart failure when we go to another patient. Sorry. So in that particular patient we just discussed, we would have to you know, rearrange the medications for this patient so that an SGLT2 has been included and also that we made sure that a statin has been added. This, she has already had CABG, so we have to put her on a good statin, good dose, so that we drive down the LDL as low as possible. One of the other problems in Indian patients is our HDL is not high enough. And you can do whatever you want, it doesn't come up. You know, it just comes up. So one of the big L, you know, lipid gurus, uh, Mike Davidson says, drive the LDL to the HDL level. You can't raise the HDL, but drive the LDL below. So coming to clinical scenario two, this is a 67-year-old woman, hypertension for 15 years, diabetes for seven years, and TGL for many, many years. BMI 28, so obviously obese. Recent A1C 8.2. On metformin, glycoside, and teniliclipin. Sorry about the spelling. She's on atorvastatin 20 and an, an olmisartan 40. So based on CV outcome trials, should she be considered for a change in medications? Do CV outcome trials tell us anything about people who are at high risk? Okay. Unfortunately, it really doesn't give us that particular easy roadmap. But just to tell you what SGLT2 inhibitors do to the risk factors. You can see on A1C, blood pressure and body weight, which is what this woman has. And all those little things that you see going up are all placebos usually placebos or other comparators. All those things that you see going down are the SGLT2 inhibitors. So really important to know that we are driving the risk factors down. And really that is how 
you know, one of the main ways we want to get to the, improve the outcomes in people with high risk factors. So when you see someone with multiple risk factors and when you know that they are at high risk for cardiovascular disease, because that's why I set the stage at the beginning and showed you at what high risk women are for cardiovascular disease, you might want to factor this in your decision making. So here I want to show you a couple of things. There's elevated risk of cardiovascular disease prior to clinical diagnosis of type, even type two diabetes, even before the diabetes. So the clock starts, seems to be, you know, starting to tick even earlier in women, sooner in women. And so do we have to be aggressive about pre-diabetes and risk factors? Here we already have diabetes, which means we have to be quite aggressive. And also there seems to be a lot of sex differences in endothelial function markers even before conversion to pre-diabetes. So you can see that not only is it in pre-diabetes, even before that. So maybe these are all the reasons why women seem to be particularly at higher risk in addition to, of course, other social determinants of health or inherent biases that are built into healthcare deliveries. So anytime someone has atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk factors, we need to modify each and every one of them. We still don't have one drug that we can, you know, put in the pot and stir that will take care of everything. We just don't have it. So we need to address lipids separately, blood pressure separately. We need to, uh, you know, A1C separately. Maybe this uh, SGLT2 is coming a little close because it does have a little benefit on blood pressure, a little benefit on uh, HDL, and, a, in, and definitely some benefit on A1C. But it really won't bring everything to target level. So you have to address each one of these individually very, very carefully. Now moving on to our third patient, type 2 diabetes for the past 12 years, treated with metformin and bildagliptin more recently, diagnosed with heart failure for the past one year, and is on conventional anti-failure medications. A1C is 7.3, history of hypothyroidism as well. So given the evidence from the new SGLT2 CV outcome trials, should she be changed to an SGLT2? Okay, so sorry about this. In the HER study, which is a you know, menopause uh, hormone replacement therapy study, Diabetes is the number one risk factor for heart failure in women with coronary artery disease, disease, as you can see. So something that you have to seriously consider. And also, the moment that you add diabetes to coronary artery disease, the risk it in more than doubles. And then if you, the patient is also quite obese, then you can see it, it you know, triples and quadruples and keeps going up the risk for uh, serious heart failure. Now, one of the best things that has come out of CV outcome trials, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of things like three-point mace and other things, but clearly, clearly what has come out is its benefit on heart failure, okay? So you can see whether it is Declare um, and Empareg and Canvas and, uh, you know, Credence. You look at any of them, if you look at the hospitalization for heart failure, clear benefit in, in, in all three classes, obviously some a little better than the others. So you, we need to keep that in mind and use this agent when we are dealing with people with heart failure. So again, just to uh, show you the, the recommendation from ADA EASD, if heart failure or CKD predominates, preferably SGLT2 with evidence of reducing heart failure and or CKD progression, obviously, if there is CKD. If SGLT2 is not tolerated or contraindicated, or if eGFR is less than adequate, then you might want to consider um, a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And then, of course, if A1C is still above target, you definitely want to avoid TZD in this setting and consider you, you know, adding other agents with proven CVD benefit. You can use a DPP-4, but not a saxagliptin and you can use basal insulin, and insulin itself, we know, can increase the risk of heart failure simply from fluid retention and SUs, and, and especially now after Carolina, as Dr. Ramchandran said, it has given a real, I think, shot in the arm for glimiparide than anything else. So clinical scenario four is a 47-year-old lady with diabetes and hypertension for eight years, early proliferative retinopathy, eGFR is 45, A1C is 7.4,
present medications are lenagliptin, metformin, and 10 units of glargine, frequent hypos with the SUs. Is she a good candidate for SGLT2? After Empire Green allowed come and credence. So one of the best things to happen to in diabetes care is with after Empareg and after um, Credence is that suddenly we are starting to focus on renal function, about measuring eGFR and not just ordering some creatinine and, and looking at that like you know old fashioned when I was in training. We have to do eGFR. And we're also starting to look at, again, I think microalbumin has got a fresh new you know, lease on life. Uh, suddenly in the middle, microalbumin was fading, but now I think it has a new lease on life as well. So you can see the renal outcome data. Um, it is really, really very robust when you look at Empareg and when you look at the you know, Creedence studies. So very, very significant, good improvement with uh, renal, you know, with progression of, whether it's progression of microalbumin to macroalbuminuria or um, renal composite outcomes and regression of albuminuria. So definitely we need to consider this agent. And if you look at the renal parameters in, um, in the EMPAR-REG study in EGFR, you can see that up, there is this good maintenance and I think that is something for us to, there's always an initial drop in both, but then it'll come back up and, and say, stay steady. And, and that is something to keep in mind. And um, just to show you whether it's incident or worsening nephropathy or a post hoc uh, composite outcome or progression to macroalbumin, we got positive outcomes in all of them. So it's really one of the best things to come out in the CV outcome trials. So the last, I think, last one, uh, two patients, 70-year-old lady with history of hip fracture, admitted now for Collie's fracture. History of diabetes for 20 years, on metformin, glipicide, and tenilicliptin. A1C is 8.4 and has a long history of unstable angina. She has refused evaluation and intervention. Her physician son from the US, and we know that we all go through this, wants her to be started on empagliflozin because that is the recommendation now in the US if you have somebody with cardiovascular disease. But our local physician here was uh, reluctant because they were worried about bone fractures after what we heard from Canvas. So what should we do? So I think what has happened, so when you look at adverse events with SGLT2 inhibitors, you look at bone fractures, evidence is actually um, inconsistent or actually now we can be quite comfortable about prescribing in patients and more studies show you know increased risk possibly what happened especially um, within the canvas study was that and because it was upper arm fractures and it happened within the first few months chances are there was some um, postural hypotension some dehydration some fall and possibly some you know, fractures like that. So this again is a teachable moment. We want to empower our patient about three things when we put them on SGLT2. Number one, to drink adequate amount of fluid, especially in Chennai, especially in our country, uh, adequate amounts of fluid. And if they are worried about so much sugar is going out, so much urine is going out, actually there is only one more urination than usual, one more. We can live with that. So they have to do drink more water. The second thing you have to empower patients is to use the, the health faucet and clean themselves after each urination because you don't want the sugar sitting around and that's what gives the vaginal mycosis. And very interestingly, I think even um, the India studies have shown that we have less of the vaginal mycosis in women in India and that may be from the, using the health faucet. The third thing is you don't want to have your patient on an SGLT2 when they go in for a procedure or get hospitalized for sickness. Then we can avoid the rare um, euglycemic DKA and things like that. So just these three things if we keep in mind, I think we are good to go. The last one is 39-year-old um, lady, history of GDM at age 30, now has type 2 diabetes, strong family history of coronary artery disease, She's on CITA and metformin and her A1C is 7. No symptoms at all of coronary artery disease. BMI is 29 and her lipids are abnormal. HDL is 32, TGA is 190, LDL of 90. Um, she has intermittent microalbuminuria. And what about her being a candidate for SGLT2? So I want to show you something. 
So cardiometabolic implications of postpartum weight changes in the first year after delivery. Just within one year after delivery, this is what happens to women who have had GDM. Their cardiovascular profile, you know, risk factors are all over the place, everything goes up. And not only are they at risk for future type two diabetes, we now know unequivocally that there is a high risk of cardiovascular disease in women who have had GDM. I mean, irrespective of developing diabetes. And not just full-blown GDM, even mild dysglycemia, even those who tested on the 50-gram GCT are at increased risk for future cardiovascular disease. So even mild glucose intolerance may be associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And then GDM is also an increased risk for CKD. So that is something also now to keep in mind. Just all the problems keep adding up for women with GDM. So, and, and you also know when people have, um, you know, microalbuminuria, there is a correlation with carotid intima medial thickness. So if you want to use that vague term, subclinical atherosclerosis, I don't know what that means, but if you want to think about that in terms of this. So anybody who has had GDM and progressed to type 2 diabetes, um, and the impact of subclinical atherosclerosis on cardiovascular, the, the, the MESA study also showed that, showed this, that if you have increased coronary artery calcium score, um, you are at greater risk for um, coronary artery cardio, you know, cardiovascular events. So you take somebody who's at very high risk for um, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and should we be putting them on an agent that potentially could decrease their risk for future cardiovascular risk? So that's food for thought. There are no official guidelines on that. You can think about it. But this is the best thing that the ADA and ESD have given us, that not only the therapeutics are just one small part of overall care of diabetes. It should really be uh, a very holistic looking at the whole person and, and for, you know, particularly if it's a woman, uh, looking into her reproductive history, talking to her about the, is she planning a pregnancy? Could she be pregnant? Um, could, is she using birth control? Does she want to get pregnant? And, um, and discussing those things, her, um, the social determinants of health, her affordability of medications, support system at home, all of those things have to be discussed because women have um, a different uh, life cycle from that of men. And, and we need to keep that in mind. And I'd like to end with my favorite thing that is men and women are equal, but not the same. Thank you.